Hi, welcome to week 10 of History 358. Um, this week we're going to begin moving into the post-1945 period, and our focus this week will be on the rise and fall of Stalin's successor as head of the Soviet government, head of the Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev. Um, but before we turn to Khrushchev, um, I wanted to wrap up our consideration of the Second World War, which was our topic last week. Um, the, let me just turn to the uh, slides here as we do this. The Soviet Union emerges victorious from the Second World War, having defeated Nazi Germany for various reasons that we talked about uh, last week in lecture. But um, that victory was tempered by a tremendous sense of loss. And so here you see the terms for today. I'll come back to those momentarily. Um, sorry. The Soviet victory was tempered by this tremendous and overwhelming sense of loss. Uh, the Soviet army had suffered somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million military casualties, comparable to the number of German casualties suffered uh, on the Eastern Front during the war. But to that Soviet army death toll, we have to add an additional 15 to 20 million civilian casualties. A truly staggering figure. No other country experienced civilian casualties even close uh, to what the Soviet Union had endured. So when we talk about the Soviet Union's wartime losses in total, uh, we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 million deaths, men, women, and children. A full 12 to 15 percent of the Soviet Union's pre-war population is killed in the Second World War. And when you factor in other long-term effects of the war, uh, disease and dismemberment, chronic malnutrition, the psychological trauma, the impact of witnessing wartime atrocities, it's safe to say that there's not a single family in Soviet Russia left unscathed by the war. The war hit home in painful, tangible ways for every Soviet family, without exception. Demographically, the war left its marks on the Soviet population. There was a significant gender gap as a result of the war. So many men were killed in the war that as late as 1959, nearly 15 years after the war's end, there are 20 million more women than men in the Soviet Union. You have an entire generation of children raised by widowed mothers or brought up uh, as wards of the state, uh, as orphans. The number of Soviet Jews declined by 60% uh, as a result of Nazi genocide. So the scale of the wartime casualties uh, that the Soviet Union suffered was unlike anything in human history. As devastating as the losses had been uh, for all combatant nations in the First World War, the losses in the second um, completely outstripped those. So. Um, no country could match the scale of loss that the Soviet Union had endured. Uh, and again, not a single Soviet family staggered out of the war um, without having lost someone, a father, a brother, a husband, a fiancé, a wife, a mother, a daughter. Uh, so again, it's not just frontline soldiers, but uh, civilians as well who suffered unspeakable horrors in this war. And the memory of uh, that loss lingers long. And I think to understand Soviet foreign policy in the decades that follow the war, we have to understand and take into account the scale of loss, the enormity of loss. Um, so yes, this is a victory for the Soviet Union. It's a victory that is remembered and celebrated by Russians to this day. Um, 
70 plus years after the end of the war. Uh, it's, a, it's a victory that is commemorated uh, and made visible, made tangible through enormous monumental uh, sculptures such as you see here. These are statues from the Park of Victory uh, on the site of uh, Stalingrad, now Volgograd. Um, you see this is a popular tourist destination. Russians from all around the country come to Volgograd uh, to celebrate their country's victory, but also to commemorate loss. I mean, you see the triumphal, um, victorious imagery here, uh, the enormous statue of the motherland calling her people forward to fight uh, the Soviet uh, soldier, this muscled soldier here in the front. But with that victory, with that sense of, um, of, 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 of heroism, comes also always a sense of the memory of loss. And this is a theme that is reflected again in the uh, larger than life monumental uh, sculpture that uh, commemorates the Soviet Union's victory, but also loss in the Second World War. And here you see a good example, um, a grieving uh, woman uh, mourning over uh, the fallen soldier uh, beneath her, his face covered by a veil. So <clears throat> when we think about the Soviet Union's victory in the war, it's again a victory tempered by enormous loss. Yes, the Soviet Union comes out of the Second World War as a winner. Yes, the Soviet Union comes out of the war as a global superpower, but a superpower almost by default. On the European continent, there are no other claimants to, to, to superpower status. Germany has been destroyed. Britain and France are economically devastated. So while the Soviet Union is on the winning side in 1945, it's reeling. And the process of post-war reconstruction, rebuilding after the devastation wrought by Nazi occupation, uh, that, that post-war reconstruction is an arduous and extremely expensive uh, process. The US economy, just for a point of comparison, had doubled in size during the Second World War. The Soviet economy, uh, thanks to the devastation produced by uh, Nazi occupation, the Soviet economy had been cut to a mere quarter of its pre-war size. Uh, by 1945, the Soviet economy was 20% smaller uh, than it had been in 1941. And yet, the Soviet economy is the second largest in the world at war's end. The Soviets are a major military presence now, a major military power. They have 11 million men in uniform by 1945. And the Red Army uh, is currently occupying, at war's end, half of the European continent all the way to Berlin. So what this means is that uh, by 1945, the Soviet Union, the USSR, has achieved uh, something that Lenin could only have dreamed of uh, three decades before, superpower status. The Soviet Union, at the end of the Civil War in the early 1920s, right, had, had come out on top over the whites, but was still um, haunted by the specter of capitalist encirclement. Now, in 1945, the Soviets are a major global power, uh, economically, militarily, culturally as well. No, uh, no longer outnumbered, no longer encircled by the forces of capitalism, the Soviet Union is now a major global player. And that new status of global superpower will help to uh, shape and inform not only Soviet foreign policy, 
but Soviet domestic policy as well over the next four decades. The world itself is divided into two hostile camps as a result of the Second World War. Fascism is defeated, but the wartime alliance between the forces of liberal democracy and capitalism on the one hand, and Soviet style uh, socialism on the other, that wartime alliance breaks down very, very quickly. And the period from 1945 to 1989 uh, globally is referred to as the era of the Cold War. Uh, and I asked you last week to read that interview um, between a Pravda correspondent and Stalin, uh, sort of asking Stalin his opinions on the state of the world uh, post-1945. Uh, the reality is that the world after 1945 is split into two warring camps. And the Cold War is this kind of catch-all term that historical figures at the time and to this day use to refer to the uh, icy standoff between the two post-war superpowers, the US and the USSR and their respective allies an icy standoff that never resulted in a full-scale conventional war, an icy standoff that never resulted in a full-scale nuclear war, thank goodness, uh, but that very well could have. Um, we'll talk about the Cold War over the next few weeks as we wrap up the course because it comes to play a very, very important role in the USSR's relations, uh, not only with the rest of Europe, but with the rest of the world as well. And it comes to play an important part uh, in, in, in Khrushchev's uh, foreign policy, which we'll talk about this week as well. One of the most immediate consequences of the war in Europe was that the Soviet Union between 1945 and 1949, set up a backyard empire, <clears throat> excuse me, a backyard empire in Eastern Europe. And as you can see from this map, uh, which is incorrectly labeled, by the way, um, red should be Eastern Bloc, blue should be Western Bloc. But what you see here is that by the end of the 1940s, four years after the conclusion of the Second World War, the Soviet Union has managed, Stalin has managed to install friendly communist style governments up and down Eastern Europe. In East Germany, Germany of course is left divided after the war's end. Germany will not be reunited uh, as a country until 1990 at the end of the Cold War. East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria are members of the so-called Eastern Bloc. Now, in the context of the Cold War, one side would interpret every move made by the other as an offensive gambit, even if that move was made not for offensive purposes, but rather for strategic defensive purposes. So what was the Soviet government's motive? What was Stalin's motive in creating, at war's end, friendly communist-style governments in Eastern Europe? Well, the West, the US, Britain, France, interpreted Stalin's move as part of an offensive plan to spread communism by force of arms, by seditious, subversive, underground revolutionary activity. The reality is that the creation of communist regimes in Eastern Europe 
was undertaken by Stalin as part of a defensive effort to create a protective buffer zone in Eastern Europe. Stalin's reasoning went something like this. Russia has been invaded not once but twice from the West in each of the last two world wars over the past 30 years. We know the scale of devastation, the scale of loss. To prevent a third world war, at least in conventional terms, it would serve the Soviet Union's military and diplomatic interests to create a protective buffer zone of friendly governments in Eastern Europe. If the West is going to invade us, they're gonna to have to get through this buffer zone first before they hit the territory of the Soviet Union proper. Was Stalin interested in spreading global communism? Yes. Was the move into Eastern Europe um, a betrayal of, a, of understandings and negotiations between Stalin, the U.S., and Britain? Yes. Um, was it misunderstood by political actors and decision makers on both sides? Yes. So when we think about the Cold War, one of the things to keep in mind is, as I mentioned just a moment ago, each side misinterprets the intentions of the other. Each side misunderstands the goals and aspirations of the other. And it's only now in the 21st century, thanks to uh, hundreds of thousands of pages of declassified materials from US archives, from Soviet archives, uh, that we're now able to kind of piece together for the first time um, a compelling story of uh, the origins of the Cold War. And I would suggest, again, that it's a story marked by mutual misunderstanding. By the end of the 1940s, and just as an aside, let me point out, Yugoslavia and Albania are colored red. They are not military allies of the Soviet Union. Yugoslavia wants to go its own way toward building communism. Albania, for its own reasons, will seek to ally itself with Mao's China. Um, so yes, they are socialist governments seeking communism, uh, but here behind that thick white line, we see the principal countries of the so-called Eastern Bloc. Their relationship with the Soviet Union will be solidified and made formal in the so-called Warsaw Pact of 1955, a military alliance that declares a Western attack on any one of these countries is an attack against all member nations of the so-called Warsaw Pact. Uh, just as the Western countries and the USA had formed their own military alliance, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949, which also held that an attack on one member nation is an attack on all. So the stakes are raised um, by the end of the 1940s. A little war could very easily spark a global conflagration. And one of the psychological consequences uh, of the early Cold War period is this mounting sense of anxiety as both sides, the US and its allies, the Soviet Union and its allies begin to build up ever more powerful military uh, machineries as each side begins to build up ever more powerful atomic arsenals and delivery systems uh, prepared to blow up the world many times over. The world becomes a very, very dangerous place uh, in the decades following 1945. So while the threat of fascism had been vanquished, the threat of a third world war 
which promised to be even more destructive than World Wars I and II combined, loomed very, very large and hung over the heads of every man, woman, and child, not only in Europe, uh, but across the world. If the world was divided, so too was Stalin himself divided uh, in the last years of his life. Uh, Stalin, as we've seen, had been uh, intensely uh, suspicious, a suspicion verging on paranoia. Uh, he'd always been a bit of a lone wolf. He didn't have close friends. After 1945, he became increasingly isolated. He kept to himself. He spent more and more time at his country home, his dacha, outside of Moscow. And he associated only, he kept company only with his oldest uh, drinking buddies. And they ran the country. The ordinary institutions, the Central Committee of the Communist Party, hardly ever met. The party congresses, which were supposed to be held every five years, were not held at all between 1939 and 1952. Stalin's own daughter, Svetlana Aleluyeva, uh, described her father's last days in her memoirs. And she writes, he had forgotten all human attachments. He was tortured by fear, which in the last years of his life became a genuine persecution mania. And by the end, his strong nerves gave way. The mania was not a sick fantasy, she writes. He knew and understood that he was hated, and he knew why. So the real Stalin, obviously a far cry from the idealized sort of beatific image of the leader that we see in this 1950 painting. Stalin finally does die uh, of a massive cerebral hemorrhage on March 5th, 1953. And when he dies, no one knows what to expect, what will happen. Analysts in the West, the sort of the policymakers who are populating the new think tanks uh, of the Cold War era, trying to anticipate um, what the Soviets will do, are writing all sorts of position papers about what might happen when the inevitable happens, what might happen when Stalin dies, will there be a struggle for power within the party, as there had been at the end of the 1920s following Lenin's death, Will there be a full-scale civil war? Will the country implode? No one knows what to expect. That sense of uncertainty and, and paranoia is vividly captured for comedic effect in the brilliant uh, recent film, um, The Death of Stalin, the British comedy, uh, which I highly recommend. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It is a comedy, but it is satirizing a very real fear held by those within the party of what will happen when this country that has been built by Stalin, summoned into being by Lenin, but built by Stalin, what will happen when Stalin is no more? No one knows. The most powerful figures in the party at the time of Stalin's death, and here you see a photo of Stalin, uh, whoops, Stalin with some of these figures, uh, there was no shortage of possible successors, just as there had been no shortage of possible successors uh, behind Lenin in 1924. Uh, here you see uh, some of these figures. Georgi Malenkov, uh, who was head of the Soviet government. Uh, next to him, Lavrenti Birya, head of the MVD, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, the renamed Cheka. Birya is head of the secret police. Next to him on the far right, Vyacheslav Molotov, one-time Soviet foreign minister and one-time uh, the closest uh, personal 
uh, man uh, who stood nearest to the ear of Stalin. These three were the men who stood closest to him. They were the ones who had uh, held the highest positions in the state and party apparatus. They were the ones who had given the windiest, longest speeches at Stalin's funeral. Um, and if you were a betting man, you would bet that one of those three would succeed Stalin. By the way, here are some images of Stalin's funeral, a multi-day affair as mourners from across the Soviet Union uh, descended on the capital, descended on Red Square uh, to pay their respects to the fallen leader. You see these thousands of flowers piled up uh, against the Kremlin wall. Um, young pioneers forming part of an honor guard uh, to stand at Stalin's, uh, besides his body, which was lying in state. Uh, here are some Komsomol members, members of the Communist Youth League. You see their black armbands to indicate that they are in mourning. Uh, crowds in the streets of Moscow lined up uh, to file past the coffin, to file past Stalin's body and pay their last respects. Ironically, um, there's an incident where panic and rumor set in. The crowd is agitated and several hundred people are injured. Several dozen to a few low hundreds are even killed in some accounts. Um, by the by, the bustle in the streets uh, as people are lined up to see Stalin to get one last look at their beloved comrade Stalin. Um, although one may ask, what was the rush? Because the party leaders declared that Stalin would be laid in state alongside Lenin that the Lenin Mausoleum would be renamed the Lenin-Stalin Mausoleum, that Stalin's embalmed body, his preserved corpse, would be placed alongside that of Lenin. So here you see, and they actually um, um, re-chiseled, re-engraved um, um, the, the, the piece above the entrance to the mausoleum so that it reads, Lenin and Stalin, and the two leaders uh, lay side by side um, um, until 1961. So cementing even in death that close association uh, between Stalin and Lenin that Stalin had always sought to promote and project uh, during his own lifetime, right? One of the keys to his own uh, rise to power, as we saw some weeks ago. So with Stalin slumbering alongside Lenin, uh, the very real question remained of succession. Who would, who, would, who would succeed Stalin? And again, if you were a betting man in 1953, you'd probably put your money on Malenkov, on Beria, on Molotov, and yet it is Nikita Khrushchev, a relative political newcomer, in comparison to the other three. It's Nikita Khrushchev who manages to pull off this political coup and outmaneuver his rivals and succeed Stalin as head of the Communist Party. So let's look at Khrushchev's rise uh, and his biography. I want to focus our attention uh, on Khrushchev now uh, for the remainder of the week. And, these are the terms um, that, we'll be, that we'll be talking about. We'll have a couple. I'll try to break what would be an inordinately long lecture on Khrushchev, uh, break that down into its composite parts. Uh, in this first lecture, I want to talk about Khrushchev's early years and how it is that he secures political power after Stalin's death. 
and begin to look at the policy of de-Stalinization. Uh, in our second lecture, we'll look more closely at the question of de-Stalinization uh, by examining uh, the issue of what to do with the labor camps. What do you do with the gulag? How will those prisoners be treated? How will Khrushchev's rule signal a, a shift, a new era in Soviet repressive policy? Uh, and we also want to talk too about uh, Khrushchev's domestic and foreign policies, which will lead to his fall from power in 1964. So if you want to pause these and jot these terms down, these are the terms. We won't cover them all in this one lecture, but we'll cover them over the course of this week's materials. So let's talk about Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev, or more accurately, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, or Khrushchev as we call him, in the West, uh, was born in the small town of Kalinovka in southern Russia, near the Ukrainian border, on April 17th, 1894. He's the grandson of a peasant serf, the son of a coal miner. So impeccable uh, class origins for a future member of the Bolshevik party. His family, like many working class families at the end of the imperial era uh, moved around in search of work, moved around in search of better economic opportunities. Uh, and his family um, moved to take up work in the coal mines at Yuzovka, uh, just across the provincial border into what is today Ukraine. So as a young boy, little Nikita Khrushchev had only two years of formal schooling. And that's not uncommon for working class boys and girls, even less common for girls uh, to have two years of, of schooling, uh, but not uncommon for, for boys to have only a year or two of formal schooling because the economic strains on working families uh, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century required that young boys leave their school studies behind and take up employment in order to help out the family economically, to help put food on the table. So in 1909, at the age of 15, uh, little Nikita begins training as an apprentice mechanic in the town of Yuzovka, where his father is working as a coal miner. And again, this is um, in Eastern Ukraine today, uh, part of that very close to, in fact, that contested territory, disputed borderlands between Russia and Ukraine today. So that Eastern region, the coal mining region of Ukraine. Now this part of Ukraine at the turn of the 20th century was the heart, the hub of the imperial coal mining industry. There were lots of jobs, lots of opportunities, sort of a boom area for work. And Khrushchev, as a young man, as a young boy, um, goes through apprenticeship in various aspects of the coal mining and coal production process. He worked as a pipe fitter, he worked as a machine operator, and eventually he's trained too as a coal miner. When World War I breaks out, um, he's 19 years old, 20 years old, he becomes involved in the trade union movement. He's helping to organize his fellow coal miners and push for uh, economic advantage, push for higher wages, push for better treatment. Um, when the revolution comes, he joins uh, the Red Army. He joins with the Bolsheviks. He fights against the whites, and in 1918, he formally joins 
the Communist Party, the Bolshevik Party. Um, after the Civil War, when he's demobilized, he returns to his uh, town of Yuzovka. And like many Civil War vets, young Khrushchev takes up party work, state work, uh, in his home town, his home county, um, as the Soviet government, the Soviet system begins to sort of put out its roots uh, and begin the process of post-Civil War reconstruction. As a party member, young Khrushchev is stationed in various positions across the coal mining regions of Eastern Ukraine. Wherever the party needs him, Khrushchev goes. Uh, and he takes up various uh, responsibilities and various jobs throughout the 1920s. He's a very able fixer. He's able to solve problems. And he attracts the attention of a senior Bolshevik named Lazar Kaganovich. Kaganovich, shown here, um, was a, an old Bolshevik of some standing in the party. Kaganovich was a close friend and ally of Stalin. And Kaganovich takes young Khrushchev under his wing. And with Kaganovich's patronage, Khrushchev is able to come to Moscow in the mid-1920s. And he completes his education in Moscow. In the late 1920s, he graduates from the Moscow Industrial Academy uh, in 1930-31 uh, as an industrial engineer. Now, I mentioned Kaganovich's patronage of Khrushchev because I think it's a useful insight into how politics actually was performed, how politics was actually played out in a one-party state. When we think of politics in a liberal democratic setting, we think of one party versus another, right? In a parliamentary setting, we think of multiple parties wrangling for political power. In a one-party system, such as Soviet Russia, uh, power is exercised by those at the upper reaches of the party who have a network of allies, a network of supporters, a network of clients who owe their patron favors and who, when the time is right, will be asked to perform favors owed. So Kaganovich taps Khrushchev as an up-and-comer as a likely lad, as someone who will one day be able to do him, Kaganovich, a favor or two. So Kaganovich brings Khrushchev to Moscow. Coming to Moscow um, opens up a new chapter in Khrushchev's political life. By 1935, uh, Khrushchev is appointed first secretary of the Moscow City Committee of the Communist Party. He's essentially the head of the Communist Party in the capital city of Moscow. So this country boy, rough around the edges, with only the most rudimentary formal education, has risen uh, by the mid-30s to a position of great prominence and great responsibility. And again, although he has only the basics of a formal education, what he does possess in spades uh, is an exceptional sense of political skill, political acumen. And Khrushchev is a consummate politician. And, and, and one of the ways that Khrushchev wins throughout his political career until the very end is that his enemies consistently underestimate him. Right? They think he's this rube. They think he's a hayseed from the country. And that this unsophisticated uh, country boy can be outmaneuvered. And time and again, Khrushchev outmaneuvers his own rivals. Khrushchev is head of the Moscow City Party organization from 1935 to 1938. 
Uh, stop and think about those years, 1935 to 1938. This is the height of the Great Terror. This is the height of the Great Purges. What was Khrushchev doing during the Great Purges? Wow. Later, in the 50s, he would attempt to blame Stalin himself for all of the excesses of the period 36 to 38. But during that period, in reality, Khrushchev was an active, indeed a willing participant in the purges. In 1936, during the show trial of Zinoviev and Kaminev, Khrushchev, as head of the Moscow City Party organization, delivered a speech calling on Moscow party workers to educate the masses in hatred for the enemy, hatred for the counter-revolutionary Trotskyite Zinoviovites, hatred for the rightist deviationist heretics, and love for the Bolshevik party, love for our boss and teacher, Comrade Stalin. Three days before the trial ended, Khrushchev delivered a speech in which he demanded the death penalty for Zinoviev and Kaminev. He said, everyone who rejoices in the successes achieved here in our country, the victories of our party led by the great Stalin, will find only one word suitable for the fascist mercenary dogs of the Trotskyite Zinoviovite gang. That word is execution. Khrushchev does this again in 37, during the show trial, um, show trials of those years, of that year. In 38, when Bukharin is on trial, uh, Khrushchev again uh, is calling for blood. So Khrushchev is an active cheerleader during the great purges. He is enthusiastic. He's not quietly standing on the sidelines. He is absolutely cheering on the regime's uh, cannibalistic uh, search for enemies within, right? The drive for purity, the drive uh, uh, to, to, to rid the body politic of enemies within that we talked about some weeks ago. Khrushchev is an active uh, cheerleader, an active supporter, and an active participant as well. Uh, during the purges, Khrushchev assisted in the arrest and elimination of his own colleagues and friends. Of the 38 top party officials in the Moscow city and province organizations, of the 38, only three survived the purges. Of the 146 party secretaries across Moscow province, each of whom was personally responsible to Khrushchev himself. Of those 146, 136 were arrested and shot during the purges. Of the 64 members of the Moscow Province Party Committee who reported to Khrushchev, of the, 46, of the 64, excuse me, 46 were arrested and shot. We know that Khrushchev personally signed arrest sheets. We know that Khrushchev personally signed, in his own hand, death warrants. And when Stalin's Politburo set a target quota of 35,000 enemies of the people need to be unmasked in Moscow province, Khrushchev, good Stalinist that he was, upped the quota imposed upon him and said, we will find not 35,000 enemies, we will find 41 thousand enemies. Of those 41,000 arrested, no fewer than 8,500 were sentenced to death by Khrushchev's own pen. So I mention this now because, again, Khrushchev will sing a very different song in the 1950s, but Khrushchev was an avid, enthusiastic participant, instigator, catalyst one of the thousands of little wheels that helped push the purges forward during those horrific years 
of 36 to 38. Khrushchev's willingness to get behind the purges attracted the personal attention of Stalin himself. And in 1938, Khrushchev promoted, excuse me, Stalin promoted Khrushchev and sent Khrushchev to Kiev, the capital of the Ukrainian Republic of the USSR. Uh, Khrushchev in Ukraine works at the end of the 30s, early 40s, uh, to suppress so-called enemies of the people, and he will hold that position as party boss of Soviet Ukraine until the end of the 1940s. Um, Khrushchev, when the war broke out, and here you see Stalin and Khrushchev, Khrushchev grinning from ear to ear at the opportunity to stand alongside Stalin in the 1930s, at the height of one's political dreams, political aspirations. Uh, when the war broke out, Khrushchev served as a political commissar. Uh, again, the political commissars were uh, officials, party officials attached to each military unit. He attained the rank of lieutenant general, uh, and he did play an important role on the Stalingrad front uh, during World War II, uh, not as a commander, but as a planner um, at, at, at the military headquarters. And here you see Khrushchev on the left uh, in a 1943 photograph. Um, when, at the war's end, Khrushchev played a role in uh, suppressing Ukrainian nationalist resistance. There was a mass underground movement of Ukrainian partisans, Ukrainian nationalist freedom fighters in the western parts of Ukraine who were carrying on a guerrilla war against Soviet power, against the Soviet Red Army uh, to achieve independence for Ukraine, a failed, uh, hopeless effort, but an effort funded by, we now know, the CIA as part of the underground murky politics uh, of, the, of the Cold War years. Khrushchev plays a role in destroying the Ukrainian nationalist underground movement, uh, and for his efforts he is promoted once again and brought by Stalin to Moscow. He joins the inner circle, Stalin's closest inner circle, and he's there. Um, at the site of power when Stalin dies, March 5th, 1953. Now, how is it that Khrushchev, again, comes to succeed Stalin? Again, if you were a betting man in 53, uh, you probably would not have bet on Khrushchev. You would have bet on Malenkov, Molotov, Beria, Khrushchev attains the title after Stalin's death of General Secretary of the Communist Party. And apparently the party leaders in 53 had learned nothing from the faction struggles of the 1920s because it was precisely that position as General Secretary of the Communist Party that had allowed Stalin to stuff the party in the 20s with loyalists who would support him and his agenda at party congresses and vote against his rivals, vote to demote and expel from the party his political opponents. Khrushchev learns this same game. He plays the same game in the early 50s, uh, at least after 53, after Stalin's death. He's playing the same game that Stalin had been playing in the 1920s. Um, by 1956, when the 20th Party Congress meets, a third of the delegates to the Congress were men and women personally appointed by Khrushchev. One half of them had personally served under Khrushchev uh, when he was party boss of Ukraine in the 30s and 40s. So there are institutional structures 
that help us to explain Khrushchev's rise to power, how it is that he's able to build up a sizable base of support within the rank and file of the Communist Party. Um, but that alone is only part of the story. Um, ultimately, Khrushchev is able to outmaneuver uh, his chief rivals, the most senior men in the party, by a very clever political dance, a delicately negotiated exposure of Stalin's crimes, which by association implicates Khrushchev's own rivals as Stalin's accomplices in those crimes. And the first step in this political dance that will culminate in Khrushchev seizing power for himself, outmaneuvering his rivals, casting them aside, the first steps of that dance take place in February 1956 at the so-called um, secret speech at the 20th Party Congress. And here you see a photograph of Khrushchev addressing the delegates to the 20th Party Congress, February 1956. This is the first time in Soviet history that a party leader has come forward to openly criticize Stalin's policies. And it's the beginning of a series of policy initiatives, new directions, cultural shifts that collectively uh, have come to be known as de-Stalinization. So if we've spent the last few weeks thinking about the processes of Stalinization, the Stalin revolution, Khrushchev begins the process of de-Stalinization. How do you set the Soviet Union and the Communist Party on a new course without Stalin at its helm? How do you de-Stalinize? Um, De-Stalinization begins as a tactical weapon wielded by Khrushchev against his political opponents. It's an open attack on Stalin. It's an open attack on the excesses of the regime. But it's also an attempt to, again, impugn and cast dirt upon the reputations of those party leaders who stood closest to Stalin. As Khrushchev will soon learn, however, uh, once the genie of de-Stalinization is out of the bottle, uh, it's very difficult to control and manage, uh, and de-Stalinization will run away from Khrushchev. It will become something too big, too powerful, uh, even for Khrushchev to control. So I want to stop here with this, uh, at this point and resume in our next lecture with the 20th Party Congress and the processes of uh, de-Stalinization. So let me uh, stop our share and uh, stop the recording. And in our next conversation, our next lecture, we will turn to uh, 1956, Khrushchev's secret speech and the 20th Party Congress. I'll see you then.